Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got some special guests joining us today. Yes, indeed. We have uh, Cheryl McKizak, Daniel, and Don Peebles. Welcome. Hello. Nice Hello. to be back. You Welcome know, back. Yes, you know, Cheryl is the president and CEO of McKissick and, and McKissick, McKissick. Yes. And Don is the founder, chairman, and CEO of the Peebles Corporation. Mm-hmm. Let me tell y'all something. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of rappers in this room, mm-hmm. a lot of athletes in this room. Okay. This might be the most money been in this room at one time. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's a fact. It's just a fact. Might be the most money that's been in this room at one time. Just want to say that. How are y'all today? We are great. Okay. Glad to be here. Glad that you uh, are having us in to talk about Affirmation Tower. That's right. That's right. We are excited about that project. And our other pr- pr- uh, partner, Craig Livingston, uh, could not be here today, but we want you to know he's another developer in New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are proud that Affirmation Tower uh, will be owned and developed by black people. And I, I know you say y'all want it to be the most inclu- inclusive skyscraper in New York City. What, what does that mean? Yeah, but you break that down, because they came in here bullying me first, but just because I went to Hampton University, by the way. <laughs> they came in here bullying, talking all this Howard stuff. But explain what that, that project is about, and that inclusive skyscraper. Well, I'm going to let the mastermind tell you about that. Mm-hmm. Listen, it was last year when CBRE, a a large uh, brokerage firm, came to me and they said, listen, this is up for grabs. And the only person that we think can develop this is Don Peoples. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Don's a friend. He was already looking at this project. And so, you know, if the best and the brightest of this country feel that way, then we certainly know we can do this. And I'm going to let Don explain the project. Well, great. I mean, look, Cheryl and I have been friends since she and her sister were freshmen at Howard. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, Lord. Y'all got some stories. Man. <laughs> and, um, and so, and, and I was in the real estate, beginning of going to the real estate business, and Cheryl's uh, family has a long history in it, and Cheryl's done an amazing job in building her business here in New York and other parts of the country. And so... When the opportunity to come uh, build a building across the street from the Javits Center, uh, one of the major attractions in New York City, mm-hmm. I thought, what better place than to build what will be, unfortunately, the first skyscraper in New York City built by black people? Wow. That's and crazy. And I'm, I'm, crazy. I'm, I'm, it's mind boggling. 2022. Well, I'm sure black people built some, but it wasn't no black people actually behind it on the financial level. That's exactly yeah. right. That black people worked. On it, yeah. but they and not enough, by the way, because the construction tr- um, industry has been discriminating over the years as well in terms of the high-paying jobs that are generated by them. But that's changing. So I thought that you know we ought to build this building should be built um, by black developers. And so I thought about this as also we want to send a message that we all work together. Mm-hmm. That when I look at a black business person, I don't see a competitor. I see a potential partner. Mm-hmm. And and so. Uh, I called Cheryl first and uh, said, look, you know, one, I want you and your con- company as a construction company to build this building. Mm-hmm. But also, I want you to be a developer and a partner with us in that. So she came in. Craig Livingston, who's been a trailblazer in terms of economic empowerment for black real estate professionals and entrepreneurs, um, we brought him on um, as a developer as well and put together a team that's 80% black owned. And, uh, and then when we were um, designing it, I thought, we want an architect that's going to make a powerful statement. So we picked David Adjay, who I've worked with before, and who was the architect for the Museum for African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., which wow. is the most visited museum in the whole Smithsonian system since the day it opened. So when with David as you know the world's premier black architect, to have him, Cheryl's construction company, our ownership team, and then we committed to 35% minority contracting at a minimum threshold to build that building. And uh, then, you know, we ultimately, when we're designing the building, um, it was going to be super tall. But then I said, why not build the tallest building? Let's build the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. Wow. Built First building to be built by black people in New York City in terms of financially. And let's make it the tallest one in the Western Hemisphere. And so that's what we started doing. How much will this building cost to make and how long will it take? <laughs> $3.6 billion. Okay. Um, Pocket uh, change. Pocket <laughs> change. Light work. Light work. <laughs> it's some work, but 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 we're going to get it done, and uh, and 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 it will be one of the biggest projects built in New York City, and it meets two moments. So right now we're coming out of COVID, so 
America and New York has got to build back, but we got to do it differently. We got to be inclusive because that's the other moment. I mean, these protests that we've had around the country um, over the last two years, um, especially last year, was about fighting for equal treatment under the law for black people, mm-hmm. but also for us to have our seat at the table economically. And so Affirmation Tower meets both of those moments and does it in a powerful way, just like the Empire State Building and Rockefeller Center were built to bring this country out of the Great Depression. And just like the World Trade, One World Trade was built after the terrorist attack to save New York and America's resilient and freedom endures, Affirmation Tower says the American promise to us all of equal access to economic empowerment is real, and we're affirming it with this building. And how we do it is much more important than what it is or anything else, and how we're doing it is it's going to be black-owned, and it's going to be built with economic opportunities for black people in every aspect of is, the project. Is it residential, or is it going to be commercial, commercial office, space? two hotels. So starting in the podium, it'll have um, a, 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 a cultural center um, that the NAACP is putting together, and then offices for the NAACP. And then last week, Reverend Sharpton and I made an agreement that uh, we're going to bring the Civil Rights Museum there as well. So that'll be on the lower levels of the building. um, And then we'll have um, some restaurant and other space on the top of what's the podium, the bigger part. And then as we go up the tower, two hotels um, and then offices. And then up top, um, three levels of event and venue space, um, a observation deck. And to put the icing on the cake, we are putting an ice skating ring on top. On top of the building. On top of the building, 1,600 feet up in the air. Everything is intentional, so the name, the Affirmation Tower, what, 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 is, the, what is the meaning behind the name? We're affirming that we're meeting those two points in time. Mm. Um, you know, the fact that black people um, can build a building this tall in New York City says that number, we can work together and we can do something of complete excellence. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we have here. Um, when you look at the tower, it looks like it's upside down. Mm. And that's another message. We are turning things upside down. We want to open up this system to people like ours. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, when black people are owners, it creates an ecosystem where we help people all along the line. We're going to have, you know, over a billion dollars going to uh, MWBE contractors. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. The other brilliant thing about this project that, you know, when Don came up with this, I'm like, this is just awesome. The fact that People say, well, who's going to rent there at those rents? Well, everybody, every corporation that wants to get ESG points, you know, they want to do environmental, social, and governance, which means they get MWBE points when they rent from our building because it's owned by black people. So everybody's going to rent there. So this is just going to change the whole way real estate is looked at in New York City. I want a condo there. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. I want a condo there for my kids. Absolutely. That's something I can give to them and, and that they can continue to go. My daughter goes to NYU. I mean, by the time y'all finish building, she'll probably graduate. But absolutely. How long how will you know take? that? How you, how you do that? Because she's a sophomore. It's going to take longer oh, than two oh, years. Oh, definitely. It's going to take longer than two years. It's going to take longer than two years. How long is this going to take to actually complete? It'll take us, a, when we start construction, about three years. Okay. And before that, and, and, and it'll take about a year and a half of design. So we're about five years out from this. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's important to know also, it'll be the best building in New York City. Absolutely. And one of the best buildings in the world. Um, it'll be attractive to, you know, uh, tenants that want to come there, but also it's accessible. I mean, and it affirms the promise of what America is supposed to give us. And affirmative action became some, I mean, I think you know, conservatives tried to make it a bad name, but um, mm-hmm. We need, I mean, we got an unfair system. And I tell people when they say we're in a meritocracy right now, I say, well, that's like saying you got two race drivers at the Indianapolis 500, both driving Ferraris. One of them um, is a better driver. A is a great driver. Driver B is a little bit better. And so driver A's white guy, driver B's brother. Okay, so driver A gets to start off on lap 450. (laughs) <laughs> and, okay? and driver B is on lap one That's and they say may the best driver win so the only way the best driver wins is if driver A crashes and burns and so we can't have a system based on that and that's why we got to take affirmative aggressive steps to right these wrongs and 
and knock down these barriers that have impeded our people from making greater progress. And we cannot keep focusing on this aspect of trying to make us more comfortable being poor or make us more comfortable with these injustices. We got to say we want our seat at the table economically and we want a better life for our children and for ourselves. And we are demanding our share economically. And, uh, and that's what Affirmation Towers. How difficult was it to get this project? Um, well, I mean, that's another and story. we're still fighting for it. <laughs> we I fighting. mean, we are fighting for it now. Um, it's very difficult, but I, I mean, I expect it to be difficult. I mean, throughout my career, you know, building my first building um, back uh, in 1986, um, that was hard. And that was in D.C. in my hometown. Um, and every building we've built, um, you know, has come hard fought. But we're knocking down barriers each day. And in reality, you know, Dr. King, you know, Mecca Everts, John Lewis, it was hard for them, too. So I believe, though, that we as black business people have a responsibility, not just to make some money, but to make a, it easier for the next generation by knocking down these barriers and doing some of this heavy work. And uh, so I welcome the opportunity to do it. Yes. Okay. And we're doing it in other cities. Mm -hmm. We just want a huge project in Boston. What was that, last week? Yep, last week we got... Uh, Boston. I'm yep. sure that was the hardest fight. With the Republican governor. Yeah, wow. Actually, it was easier <laughs> really? because... So, give you a sense. So, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a big... I'm a Democrat, lifelong Democrat, but I'm like what Henry Kissinger said about America. He said America has no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent, permanent interests. Interest. Black people, we got to have no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, permanent interests. So, the governor, Charlie Baker, in Boston decided that he was he he saw the unfairness in the system so what he did is every project that he's doing in that state 25 points out of 100 is for equity for people of color mm. and so in new york city for example for affirmation tower it was initially five points out of 100 and we had to scream and shout and we got it up to 10 points but so if you value economic inclusion and you're willing to take some affirmative steps then you can get some good results so cheryl we brought our company to uh, Boston where we're doing business um, and pursued this project together. And uh, $500 million life sciences and um, mixed income housing uh, in the uh, Chinatown leather district and just won that. And, uh, and so that's also about how we got to work together. So when we see opportunities as black business people, we got to bring others with us. And that's why I brought Cheryl to Boston. One, she, her, she and her firm are exceptionally talented, but also... Um, we ought to be about sharing opportunities with each other. Unity and group operation. I, I always ask this question, and I don't even know if you can have one without the other, but what's more important, economic equity or equality? Oh, wow. That's a really good question, but <laughs> I would say the economics are very important mm -hmm. because then that's going to help create the equality, in my opinion. Um, you know, Don always says this, this about venture capitalists, and there's $69 trillion of money out there that's been invested. But only 1.3% of it has been invested by black firms. Hmm. Um, so we are so upside down on the economic uh, ladder that we just have to do something about that. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Affirmation Tower is all about. You know, what's interesting for us is, you know, we have a very long history in construction and design. And the natural progression when you're in construction is to go into development. Well, other white firms have been doing that for years, um, but we have just not had the opportunity. So Affirmation Tower, when it came along, Don says, Cheryl, it's time for you to take that next step, mm. and you need to be a developer. And that's how we became part of the development team. Um, and thank God I have a really good mentor uh, who has a lot of thick skin because that's exactly what it's taking for us. I don't know if you know that an RFP was put out for this site last year. We responded. I mean, our response was top quality. It was, you know, the essence of, of perfection. Mm -hmm. And we were shortlisted, brought in for a presentation, uh, which again, uh, was great. And then we sat around and waited and waited until the state pulled the RFP. And, you know, I think what it has... What was the RFP? 
uh, request for proposal. Oh, gotcha. So the the, the state own, owns the property because it's at Javits, mm-hmm. and they went out soliciting developers to develop the site. We responded, and to do that, you have to put in a written proposal as well as do a presentation. So we went through all of that, knowing that what we put on the table was the absolute best solution. I mean, we have gotten international press. Um, because it's the first skyscraper built by black people in New York. I mean, the only other building I know south of 125th Street is Don's residential building that, you know, he finished a few years ago at 120 Leonard Street. Mm-hmm. I don't know any other development of that size. That was $350 million south of 125th Street. 450, built. by the way. Just oh, another 450, I mean, you know. <laughs> 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 I know he's going to have Flex. Help with that one. Flex. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, completed project. I mean, we haven't seen it. So because of that, we start getting a lot of press. And I mean, from all avenues, people are saying, you know, this is awesome. Um, eventually, we ended up taking a poll of New Yorkers to find out how New Yorkers felt about our project. And we found out that, 20, is it 27% or 29% of New Yorkers knew about our project and they liked our project. Wow. Um, yeah, 85%, 84% supported it. Yes. Because they're supporting economic empowerment. I mean, that's, I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's what, what it's saying. about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then December rolls around and the whole thing gets pulled out from under us. And, you know, I couldn't help but feel, you know, this, this, I wonder if New York is really ready to open the door for us to do something and that's this what, big. But that's why I asked the question, right? Because you can have the money. Clearly, y'all have the money, but they may not want to give y'all the, ac- the access. Yeah. Because y'all are black. Right. Yeah. And other cities are calling us saying, can you build it here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. But we're not going to take no. We're not. Mm-hmm. No. You know? No. I mean, at the end of the day, we also walked in the door with the three point six billion dollars, too. So when we present it, we could say this bank is and this bank and this bank and us are putting up the three point six billion dollars so that they knew we could execute it. In fact, in our presentation, they said we have we're totally confident that you all can finance the project and move forward. So I think, look. Change comes at hard fought. I mean, it's one thing for us to get access to some restaurants and so forth. Another thing to get treated fair in a criminal justice system designed to hold us back and to incarcerate us. And then when we're starting to talk about money, remember this is a capitalistic democracy. The pillars of this democracy rest on capitalism. And so that's not something that they've wanted to allow us to get. So every aspect of us uh, gaining traction financially has been hard fought. And New York, number one business um, locally is real estate, real estate development, all these skyscrapers and buildings and so forth. But they blocked us uh, from from having an opportunity to do anything there. I remember uh, coming to New York to for a business meeting and I had um, uh, drinks with Reverend Sharpton at the Grand Havana Club. And he took me over the window and he said, look at all these buildings and all these lights. Now, one of these buildings owned by a black man or woman. You need to come here and do something about that. And that's what, And then a year later, I opened up an office in New York and started doing business here because he's right. We, if we can have access to economic opportunity, we can solve our own problems. Mm-hmm. We can Absolutely. deal with our own community. But yeah. you keep blocking us from economic opportunity, then we're going to continue to struggle. But the, our challenge for our people, and especially for our young people, is opportunity and access to yep. it, fair access to mm-hmm. it. So we can do it for ourselves then we can expand our community and take care of our own issues. And we can support our own organizations. And they need to stop looking at us. I said this yesterday to a group of white business people. You all need to stop looking at doing business with black people as philanthropic. Good That's right. business for you. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. Uh, uh, I'm so inspired. Right <laughs> no, me too. I, it, but, that, but we got to go back to the origin story. Because when I hear... You know, y'all knew each other as freshmen at Howard University. That's like some outliers, divine alignment type stuff. Like, did y'all both know that's what y'all wanted to do in the future? I mean, are you, of course, well, your family when was I, When I met Don, Don had bought his first apartment in D.C. Um, as and a freshman I said, at Howard? Well, I was a freshman. You were a freshman, and I was, was uh, uh, two years, I think I'm two years older than right. you. Right, so he was in I'm college, and he had bought an apartment. And I remember my twin sister and I saying to each other, well, who does that? That's who what buys I apartments know. when you're in college? Yeah. And Don said then, he said, I'm going to do transformational development. 
And so we both looked at each other and said, well, what's that? (laughs) And so basically Don has been on this path ever since then. Mm -hmm. My sister and I, we always knew we were going to be in the family business. I mean, we're fifth generation. We always knew that. But then over the years, Don was in D.C., uh, Philadelphia, and we kept saying we're going to work together. At some point, we are definitely going to work together, but it just has to be the right right project. project. Mm -hmm. You know, you you just can't do it for the heck of it. It has to make sense. Um, And so it started on the project at 120 Leonard Street um, in the village. I mean, in um, Harlem. Tribeca. 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 See, I, oh, I, I thought it was Harlem. No, Tribeca. Oh, Tribeca, right around Leonard the corner. Leonard Street. Yeah. Okay. So it's downtown. So that's what I'm saying. That is probably the largest development project completed by a black person. That's amazing. In Manhattan. Okay, south of 125th Street. Mm-hmm. And this will be the second. So this one made a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we came together on that. So we've been talking about this over the years for a very, very long time. You know, I remember there was a period of time we talked about, you know, Don um, investing in, in McKissick so yeah. we could de- uh, do your construction uh, of your, um, the maintenance part of, of his building. Um, so we've been trying to collaborate for the, a very long time, wow. and we're finally doing it on this project. So we know McKissick is fifth generation. Is people's first generation? First generation. Yep. Wow. I, I, well, you get the money to buy the apartment, Don. If you don't want to tell well, us, it was about the fair. I, start, I keep start, it to yourself. I started working. I quit college um, after my freshman year. I went. I went to Rutgers, um, and after my freshman year, went back home to D.C. Um, and started working in real estate. Mm-hmm. And, I, and frankly, I mean, it was a black government. It was a black mayor, and they were focused on economic empowerment for black people. So I felt it was a good place to start doing business. And so I got exposed to real estate because my mother was a real estate sales agent and a broker. And so I learned from her, and I also was, um, uh, you know, my mother raised me, and so I was very aware of the challenges that she had as a black woman in the real estate business. And so part of what kind of wired me was that I was going to make it different when I was in business, and that my, I'd do a company and it would be very different. So, so I focused on, I mean, I wanted to, you know, do well, and um, so I started thinking as an entrepreneur right away. And, uh, and then began working in the real estate business when I was 19. I started my own company when I was 23. Wow. And uh, built my first building when I was 26. Um, and, but I couldn't have done it anywhere else. D.C. at that time was a mecca for uh, black economic empowerment. It was Atlanta and D.C. Marion Barry. Yeah. 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 And Marion Barry for all his faults. Um, and uh, you know he was you know he just like to have a good time yeah <laughs> <laughs> the at, at his memorial service uh uh minister Farrakhan mentioned that uh someone uh, about his history of they were saying that you know he was being criticized for having a drug abuse problem and he said who are you talking about john kennedy because it wasn't just <laughs> right so, <laughs> so yeah so i mean barry was transformative and 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 the government at that time was and they knocked down opportunities uh barriers to opportunities for black business people um bob johnson got a start in dc um i got mine many other black business people did but i met cheryl and her sister they were um, freshmen in college uh and uh her cousin was a good friend of mine and uh, and so we became friends, uh, and uh, we both had kind of common interests. They were going into the family business. I was building mine, and uh, and so my son's in our business now. He's 27, and my daughter's 19, and at TCU. And I'm hopeful that she will go into the business as well, and we can build some legacy. But part of the legacy I want to build is demonstrating how we can work together, mm-hmm. because I may not be able to do a 3.6 billion dollar building by myself. Cheryl may not be able to Craig, but collectively we can. Mm-hmm. But Don, you didn't need us. You I'm, didn't. You didn't need Craig and I. Right. I mean, financially, <laughs> but I needed you all in every other way. Mm-hmm. Um, and you all brought and bring tremendous um, resources to the table. And so we're all, all of us, are contributing to this project, and um, and and we're going to make history. But also, I am hopeful that five years from now we won't be here talking about there's only two buildings built by black people. I think we got to demand opportunity because they ain't going to be given to us. And that's what history is showing us. And the fact that we can't talk about this 
big business of real estate and talk about black people being involved in it in America's most diverse city means it's not going to come easy. So we got to right. demand it. I know people are watching this man, and this they want so good, man. Hold on, I got some more questions. No, I'm, not, I'm, not saying, I'm just saying this just feels so good, man. I, I know Goodness people gracious. are watching this and they they want to know how though. Like it's you know it's easy to say I bought my first building, but but how? Where did the capital come from? Like where do, where does one start? Well, I think the first thing is with a dream. I mean, developers are dreamers. Um, we're visionaries, and so with a dream and with a plan, and becoming a student of the business. And I mean, be, you can be self-taught, read some books, learn about the business. It's not a complicated business, by the way, supply and demand. Um, and it's not complicated. So understanding the business, having a dream, and having a dream to be achievable, but mm-hmm. you know, pushing, and then um, finding an idea. Once you find an idea, then you can raise money for it. Now, um, what Cheryl touched on, if you're black, don't expect it to be easy. Because the statistic Cheryl mentioned is um, the Federal Reserve did a study last year. 30, uh, there's $69 trillion invested in private equity and venture capital. And that's normally go, that's where real estate developers get equity for their project from private equity. But there's $69 trillion invested in uh, private equity in the United States. And out of that, 1.3% of it goes to businesses owned or founded or projects found, uh, start, or worked on by blacks or women combined. So white men get 98.7% of all venture capital and private equity money. So the challenge is equity. But if you can, you can raise the money, friends and family and so on, and then build your building or buy a property and renovate it, and then do what I did is I rolled all my money back in. Mm-hmm. And I just kept rolling it back in, rolling it back in. So the first project that we did was um, $10 million. Um, back you didn't in start there, didn't you? Started with a, a, a with single, an apartment, a, a single apartment, a single <laughs> yeah, house. Right. And I think that's the question. Like you started yeah. from a single right. apartment. Yeah, but that, a, right. But then after that, that um, I focused. I, I earned. A, I started a consulting and appraisal business, and that's how I earned a living and began to accumulate some money to save. Mm-hmm. And then with that money, I found an opportunity to build an office building, and I did business with the city government. They pre-leased um, uh, an, all the office space in a building that I proposed building. And uh, that made it financeable. Mm. And even then, it was hard to finance. Um, and uh, I brought in partners, um, uh, three white guys uh, in D.C., and we split the deal 50-50. And, uh, and then uh, that was it. We were off and running, uh, got it built. Um, and, uh, but if you have a dream mm-hmm. and you're willing to do some work, you can make money in the real estate business. It's not very complicated. And people come in from being in mini storage or, I mean, one guy who's building a tall, great success story in New York, building the tallest residential building. And about 15 years ago, he was selling wigs to Orthodox Jewish women over the mm-hmm. internet mm-hmm. Um, by mail. Sold that business for like $15 million, invested it in real estate, did some houses, and now is building the uh, tallest building, residential building in New York City right now. Wow. So you, So it's the idea of being willing to dream big. And, and to go out there and, and push hard to make that dream come true. You know, we talk about the, the, the racial you know, wealth gap in America a lot. Do you think that actually can be closed in this generation? I don't think it can be closed. Mm-hmm. I think we can make some progress, but we won't do it the way it is right now. Um, and one of your former guests um, is a man I've known a long time um, and currently president. And um, and I remember his comment about if you didn't if you could make up your mind between him and Trump, you're not you black. black. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, <laughs> no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, permanent interests. But he would be at uh, right now in the Delaware um, waterfront on the porch of his house. <laughs> um, if it wasn't for black people, if it wasn't for black people, <laughs> but it's time to pay up. Mm-hmm. And I mean, pay up um, in other ways by giving us access to economic opportunity. So the federal government's pension system for their employees, last I checked, didn't have one black asset manager. Mm -hmm. Not one. Change that. uh, The federal government hasn't leased a major office building in the tens of millions of square feet it leases in Washington, D.C. alone, a black city. They've leased less than 100,000 square feet from black developers. Lease several million square feet of office space from black developers. The way to deal with us, if you, wanna, if you want to treat us right, is give us economic opportunity. And that's when we close the wealth gap. Mm-hmm. A place like Boston, the average, according to the Federal Reserve, 
the average household net worth of a white family in Boston is $247,000. The average household net worth of a black family is $8. $8. That is an insurmountable wealth disparity without affirmative, it, aggressive $8? effort. $8? $8. Oh, God. <laughs> $8 to $247,000. And so you can't solve that by taking baby steps. And we cannot let these, uh, frankly, we can't let these liberal Democrats m- continue mm-hmm. to try to make us comfortable That's right. being poor. Mm-hmm. I mean, I look at, the, I, I give an example of what, if, if, if a black man walks across Madison Avenue and gets struck by a car and is laying out in the ground and it's raining outside and it's cold, the way a liberal is going to deal with that is going to say, oh my God, you are bleeding. Let me get you a rag. Get a rag. Oh my God, you could get infected. Go get some bacitracin. <laughs> oh my God, your head is laying on the pavement. Go, somebody get a pillow. Oh, my God, it's cold. Get a blanket. But where is that man sitting? On his, He's still laying on, flat on his back in the middle of the street. Not one time did they say, let me help you up right. and get back up and keep going. Right. And so we're going to have to demand aggressive steps economically, not window dressing, not hiring a few black people here and there. And by the way, the other thing, when black people get in a position of power, they got to help each other. Absolutely. We cannot get into these positions and sit in them and then just kind of keep the status quo. So then they can say, see there, we got a black person in here. So we're not racist. We're not doing anything because we can't find any qualified black people. Mm -hmm. Because if we could, the brother over here or the sister over here would be doing it. And they're not. Mm -hmm. So when we get someplace and we get an opportunity, then we got to do something with it. And that's one of the reasons why my company has focused on this issue. And I, I, I I would dare to say that I am the most outspoken advocate for equal opportunity and fair treatment for black people in business and finance and that and also that we got to do it aggressively we cannot just sit back here anymore i was going to ask you know they they put all these these things out allegedly to help uh black entrepreneurs and black developers right so they said redlining but what i was saying before was nothing is specifically for us right so what are your thoughts on that because they'll say it's specifically for us but down when well, the really set look asides are specifically for us, but what? they're set asides. Mm-hmm. They're set. A, they're a small piece of, you know, a huge pie that they want us to take and split up in fifty different directions. So, you know, that doesn't help anyone. What do you mean, like opportunity zone legislation? Opportunity stuff? zones oh. or certain areas where they say that you know we should be able to invest, but and I tell people all the time, opportunity opportunity zones is just not for black people. Anybody can invest in opportunity. Oh, sure. So there's Absolutely. nothing really for us that they say. It sounds great. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there's nothing specifically to say, okay, to guide us and say, okay, well, this is for y'all to help or this is for y'all. Have y'all seen any of that where it's specifically for us and no. builders out there and people that are out there that they can look for? Well, no. I've seen it. I've seen it only once or twice in one instance. By the way, on Opportunity Zones, you're 100% correct. Think about this. Remember Long Island City, mm-hmm. which is an Opportunity Zone. Who was going over there and reaping the biggest benefit? Amazon, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's for that wasn't for black people, right? That's for Amazon. So at the end of the day, I mean, when I built uh, the Royal Palm Hotel in South Beach, that's the city of Miami Beach, because of a tourism boycott. The only reason they did it, it was a tourism boycott led by black people in the 1990s because of how Nelson Mandela was treated when he visited South Florida. And to settle the boycott, the city agreed to uh, support a black-owned hotel, and I'd been on that, and we won the rights to build that in South Beach. But overall, what we should have is just a fair system. So if everything's fair, black people, we're almost 13% of the nation's population. So there should be 49 of us in the fourth 400. That's a fair system, by the way. Mm-hmm. New York City is, is, is 26% black, 29% Latino, 53% female. So the economic opportunities, at least say the investments from New York City's public employee pension system, half of it should be managed by people of color. Absolutely. Right? And the state of New York, um, about 30 percent of the retirees paying into the state pension system for the government employees retirement system are black people. So shouldn't 30 percent of that money be invested in firms run by blacks? Absolutely. None of that's done. And I have begged challenge these politicians, especially these Democrats who keep wanting our support, That's to right. step <laughs> up and pass a law saying that economic opportunities or management of our public employees' pension systems and investments by our public employee pension systems should be 
reflective of the population demographics in our communities. If we did that, I mean, think about the transformative impact because you cannot start businesses and build businesses with no money. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are frozen out. Mm -hmm. We have to run around with 10 cups to to raise money. The number one starter of small businesses in this country last year were black women. And yet black women get less than two-tenths of one percent of venture capital money. I mean, how can that be? So we got to say we at least want a fair shot at our own money, and that should be done for us. That's the only way this wealth gap starts getting closed is that we have access to capital. I mean, and in our institutions, because of the, the changing dynamics, institutions like Ebony, institutions like BLS and others, where they got taken over because the owners could no longer grow their businesses because they couldn't get access to capital. And when they did, it was on usurious terms. I mean, so you can look at a company like WeWork, mm-hmm. which is a subleasing company of office space. They've raised about $9 billion, never made a profit ever. They're losing a half a billion or so a year. And the guy who founded the company, they paid him over a billion dollars to leave. Okay, how really? is that possible? Yes. I know people that are so happy they invested in WeWork. <laughs> I don't know if they're lying to me, but they, they be like, they be like, I was a great, I invested in WeWork. Yeah. Like, but that's not a good investment? No, well, I mean, over, I mean, look, they haven't made any money yet, but they keep getting access to capital. See, that's the point. Yeah. I mean, you can build a business. If you are a white entrepreneur, you have a better shot at building a business and getting enough runway, enough time to build that business and grow it. So WeWork has been losing money for probably a decade, but they're getting more and more time. And there's a young brother who wow. founded a company called Compass, Robert Rifkin. Oh, yeah, and, Compass. And they're already putting pressure on him, yep. and they've been in business half the time and are close to making money. So, But, again, if we can get fair access to capital, because every black business person I know is always looking for money because they can't get enough of it to grow their business. Every black entrepreneur who wants to start a business it isn't the idea that is the problem. It's the money. Um, mm-hmm. And you look at these tech companies that lose all kinds of money, hundreds of millions of dollars and so forth, and it's all good. But with us, we don't. We have to be perfect. I was going to ask, you know, we always talk about HBCUs, right? You, you guys went to Howard, I went to Hampton. Um, I always feel like in a HBCU specifically, the curriculums have to change so much, right? I think it should be, yes, the curriculum is good, but... I think there should be more about real estate, more about tech, mm-hmm. more about uh, investing. And I think we don't have more, more of those classes and curriculums in those schools. You know, like I look at my daughter, I, I, went, I did the run with my daughter. I went from, you know, to Morgan, to Howard, to Hampton, to, you know, Spelman and to Clark. And, and she was into real estate, but they didn't have real estate. They had classes, but not where she can get a major and really get hands on. Tra- so she had to go to NYU. And I think that's really big because... A lot of white people, they learn from generation. They learn from their parents. They learn from their grandparents. And a lot of us don't. So what is your focus? What are your thoughts on curriculum in college, especially HBCUs? I think that's a, an excellent point. I mean, real estate, I don't know if it's taught at Howard University. I don't know where they are right now. Um, but the same thing, my kids ended up going to other schools because they were looking for organizational Science, which I didn't even know what that was when my daughter, you know, took it and graduated mm-hmm. with it. Um, and I don't know what they're teaching now at Howard University, but I think that's an excellent point. And, you know, we we can work on something like that. I mean, because yeah, you guys, the Howard. fact that if y'all went back to Howard and just, you know, bought a building, opened up class. the McKissick yeah, building, and Peebles just, class. Just, just imagine if they were <laughs> professors just one day yeah. came and, expl- and, and dropped the knowledge that they know. Well, you know I, I go mean? to, yeah. just so you know, Howard does have a real estate uh Curriculum, not a degree in real estate, but the students over the last decade started demanding um, knowledge in real estate. And so I've spoken at Howard That's on dope. the real estate program a couple of times now, maybe two or three times. And my son has gone there and spoken as well. Um, but you're right. We need to do more about that. But we also right. need to catch our young people a bit earlier. We got to catch them in high school. We got to catch them because that's where see, I learned real estate at home from my mother. Mm. Um, so I, from the time I was eight years old, I knew about real estate. So we got to, we got to teach business, um, to our young people much earlier. 
um, and do it. And and, I, and these public school systems should do it. I, I the there was a I helped start a entrepreneurial academy at a hospitality high school in D.C. that was started. That you know my company work was to start. Um, and that hospitality school was about teaching uh, young people about careers in hospitality management. And so I thought, well, they need to learn how to own hospitality businesses, hotels, restaurants, and mm-hmm. so forth. So we created and endowed an entrepreneurial academy for that school. Once that school got taken over by the D.C. public school system, they canceled the entrepreneurial curricul- mm-hmm. curriculum. We've got to demand that the public school system teach our kids and expose them to business early on. The private school my daughter went to, they started at ninth grade. You could have entrepreneurial classes. So mm-hmm. if we can't teach, if our kids can't learn it at home, um, then and they can't learn it in school, then they won't learn it, mm-hmm. and they'll look at other alternatives. But there is a much, much higher percentage chance of being someone like me, um, and making a billion dollars in real estate than it is to be an average NFL or NBA player. Much higher percentage of doing what I do and really? doing it to that level. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can you can make yeah. yourself get better. Every year that you do this business, you will get better at it, um, and you will learn more, and you will accumulate wealth. And the number one thing about real estate, this is the, this is the best part of real estate. We're going to work hard for five years to build um, Affirmation Tower. But once Affirmation Tower is built, mm. it'll be turned over to, to professional property managers, and it will make us tens, hundreds of millions a year. And we're on to the next building. Mm-hmm. So you build buildings, whether they be as big as that, or a 100-unit or 50-unit or a 20-unit apartment building. Once you do that and you're done, you manage that, the income comes in. As long as it's well-managed, it comes in forever. Mm-hmm. And then you just work the next time. You take your time. And then go on to the next project and build that. And so over a 10-year period, you could own or build five or six buildings. And now all of them are working for you. An old friend of mine, he passed away earlier this year, Art Reynolds. Mm -hmm. Um, He told me that when I was in my early 20s, he said, I want you to remember something here. There's two things I'm going to tell you. It's okay to be broke, and it'll be okay to be old. Just don't meet up with them at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) But, but, but then he told that. me something that was even more impactful to me is that your money can work harder than you. Absolutely. Your money doesn't get sick, doesn't fall in love, doesn't have, you know, get sad. It doesn't get tired, doesn't, doesn't get need old. to sleep, doesn't get old. It just works. That's right. So make more of it and put it to work. And that's the thing about real estate. You can mm-hmm. put your money to work, and it survives generationally mm-hmm. because they don't. your next generation doesn't even have to have an interest in the business. As long as they don't sell the assets and they continue to be professionally managed, real estate values go up with inflation, mm-hmm. rents go up, and you keep mm-hmm. making money. And that's how wealth is created, and we got to tell our young people that. I've been screaming it. It's a better business than a service business, that's for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm as good as my next project, and that's why my ancestors bought a uh, apartment houses and and build apartments back in nashville tennessee Mm -hmm. and property that you know my parents still own Mm -hmm. um as as don said it works for you for much longer time i want to ask y'all you know you know y'all don brought up something i what do y'all what do y'all what does reparations look like for y'all like what is reparations this would be a good one (laughs) Well, I, think, I, mean, I, I mean, I I agree with you there, I, but I think more important, I mean, the on Affirmation Tower, the state of New York isn't doing us a favor. I'm, we're paying them more That's money. True. We're, we're paying, paying them more board. money, Absolutely. 300 and some million dollars for the property, more than anybody else offered to pay them. No one offered to build a $3.6 billion building. We're offering to build the tallest, the biggest, and the most expensive. And as a result, it produces $5 billion of revenue to the state in the first 30 years, almost a billion in year one. Mm-hmm. So they're not doing us a favor. Reparations no. to us, I think that what's realistic for us is that the entire system of how our government does business changes and is reflective of population demographics. Every con- So if you're in a city that's 50% black, 50% of the government contracts go to black businesses. 50% of the money, the public employee pension systems and so forth, are invested with um, you know, black business. 
if you take, if you're a business like, you know, Goldman Sachs or whatever, and you are taking um, institutional capital as an investment advisor, then you've got to deploy that reflective of the population demographic. So if you're running a national business, black people are 13% of the population, 13% of the loans have to be made to black businesses and black people on the same terms that you make them to the white firms. So if we could do that, just a fairness system, just that, I mean, we would make great progress. But what has happened here is that the impediments to our, uh, to us having fair opportunity are compounded by these obstacles and these injustices economically. Mm-hmm. What we have in this country is economic apartheid. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no other way to call it. We, I mean, in cities like New York, where, we're, uh, where people of color are a majority of the population and they can't figure out how to do le- more than 10% of their business with minority in, uh, firms or women-owned firms, I mean, that's economic apartheid. So we got So what reparations looks like is fairness. Give us a fair chance. There should be a hundred companies in New York like mine, and there should be, you know, thousands of other real estate entrepreneurs getting fair access from all these banks that the government has bailed out. Every ten years, they get bailed out um, for you know for taking reckless uh, positions, not making loans to us. So by the way, mm-hmm. um, and so. I think we got to demand that. And that's what I, reparations would look like that. To me. Well, Brother Don, I can't buy no building with fairness. I need some capital. Right. You know what I mean? So don't you feel like America owes us something tangible? Yes. Like Sounds some, good to me. Yeah. yeah. But I think America <laughs> owes us something tangible yes. by giving us capital. Right. And I think that, look, I think we are, there should be some area, place where there's like a, a, a pool of capital that goes to black people. Mm-hmm. And the sort black of like people. the PPP loans right. yeah. that yeah. went to the businesses over COVID. There mm-hmm. ought to be that for black people. But not loans. There should be no, you, and, and if you and if you execute yes. what, yes. No, and if you execute, <laughs> then you don't pay it back. Exactly. Right? I mean mm-hmm. that's what I mean these these uh, these loans that were given to these big organizations um who really didn't even need the money, mm-hmm. they as long as they kept their job numbers at a certain level, they never have to pay it back. Mm-hmm. So things like that. But I think we also have to say, okay, what about property? What about property that we lost or property that Mm -hmm. we didn't have fair access to or property was taken from us? That has to be adjusted. The cash cash reparations or returning of property needs to take place. The challenge we got here is that the system has kept going and these properties and so forth have transferred multiple times. So, again, money, valuing that and letting people make claims. Um, like um, the Jewish community got to do after the Holocaust, they, mm-hmm. I mean, pursued, the, you know, their property that was stolen from them by uh, by the by these Nazi criminals that you know around the world, and they were able to go after it. We should have a way to go after the economics of our loss. Right. I love the whole property idea because I, the ownership of property of Black people, we know that's been taken over the years absolutely uh and and some of the the most money making establishments have been built on those properties and to be able to take that back i i love that idea absolutely. and also uh, home ownership right home ownership you know in our business it's all about bonding and having a balance sheet and that's what black people need we need a balance sheet and so you know there could be money a uh, fund set aside to help black businesses and you know support them with whatever business they want to go into. I love real estate development, mm-hmm. but there are plenty of businesses that we can go into, but we just don't have the capital, and we need it. How difficult is it navigating the construction industry and the real estate industry as a black person? It's hard knocks. Yeah. It has been. <laughs> well, a black woman. I black mean, that's woman, even yeah, harder, yeah, right? Even harder, yeah. I, yeah, 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 I mean, Don talked about... Um, Black females starting the, the most businesses. However, we're still only 2% of the businesses in New York City. 2%. Um, and so when you talk about the programs that have been set up, and DJ Envy, you kind of touched on it when you said, have any of these programs programs been set up for us? When you look at the MWBE program in the city of New York, 52% of it is white women. Mm-hmm. So, you know, then we share the rest with Asian Americans, uh, and and that's also including uh, Latino X. So, you know, when you break it all down, like I said, it's really crumbs. Mm-hmm. And so how was I able to build a business in New York? It was really pushing prime opportunities, not where I was a sub-consultant, 
you know, working under the umbrella of a large firm. No, I had to be the lead person. Whether that was a $2 million project that turned into a $5 million project or $10 million project. But that was all a fight Mm -hmm. because there are no laws out there for that. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to create relationships and, you know, convince people to give you this shot. Like we're trying to convince the state of New York to give us this shot. And that's coming from a fifth generation company. So I can imagine. Oh, yeah. 230 years. Wow. 230 years. Wow. And we're still having to prove who we are and still not getting the access that we should get. So, Don, you you like a magician. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, you performing magic <laughs> tricks out here to build your company. I mean, I mean, I got, I, as I said, I was fortunate because I started in D.C. And I started in the 1970s, late 70s and early 80s. So the 80s is when I built my business. And that was a time when there was a consciousness of empowering black business people. And you had cities uh, like Atlanta and mayors like Maynard Jackson, Harold Washington in Chicago, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Barry in D.C., and they were focused on providing economic empowerment for black people. So I got the benefit of that. And, uh, and, and But everything is harder for us. I mean, access to capital. Cheryl, um, Cheryl's talking about how she has to prove herself. We always operate, unfortunately, with a presumption of n- not being capable. So white business people get the presumption of competence. Mm-hmm. And so... They'll, and if they make a mistake and lose money, hey, it could be a market condition or something else, <laughs> right. right? But it's not their fault by and large. Or hey, people, you know, you don't have to bat a, a you know, a thousand. But when it comes to us, there's a, you've got to prove and demonstrate your competence every time. I mean, I've had to have my, um, even when we have an account, you know, our financial statements are certi- you know, certified by our accountants, I've actually had a couple of governments want me to show them bank statements and wanting them for four months to make sure I've had the money for at least four months and then put it in there at the last minute. I mean, and we're talking, I mean, so, you know, um, and, 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 and so that kind of thing is a part of how this systemic discrimination continues to impede progress, Mm -hmm. you know, essentially no access to capital. And the irony is it's a lot of it's our money, New York city, the controller of New York city makes decisions on how to invest money. Okay, Brad Lander should be responsible to invest money reflective of the population demographics of New York City. Mm-hmm. Tom DiNapoli, the controller of the state of New York, he's a sole trustee. He makes this, him by himself makes a decision on where capital is invested. So if it's not invested with black people, it's because he chose not to do it. And we can't accept that. So and these are elected offices, by the way. So we have to say we got to start thinking more about politics again and we got to be transactional. We got to say, what are you going to do for us? I'm not going to carry the, the water of these other issues that the progressive want. We're black people. We care about schools for our kids. That's we right. want a fair uh, justice system, criminal justice system that mm-hmm. stops this mass incarceration. And we want economic opportunity like everybody else. We want our share of the American dream. And it doesn't. And we can't be like climbing Mount Everest to get it. It <laughs> needs to be right here on the ground for us like everybody else. Did either of you ever feel like, you know, y'all had to be, like, discreet, not make too much noise? Oh, absolutely. Y'all come, wow. Yes, right. You don't want to be the person who's out front uh, that's getting all the attention. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, unfortunately, at that point, black people will say you have too much. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. mean, I mean, just, you know, <laughs> we're, I'm learning a lot about our people going through this process. Like, mm-hmm. who will stand up for us and who won't? Mm-hmm. Um, And there are people who won't stand up for us because of the fear they have. They're Mm. comfortable where they are. Um, You know, they they might be a a great business person. They might be a politician, but they're comfortable where they are. And they don't want to stand up for the fight. Yeah. Um, Y'all want to build that big old skyscraper in the the white man's backyard? Y'all sure y'all won't do that? (laughs) That's right. That's right. That's right. Wow. And so, yes, we absolutely deal with that. Um, and then, you know, you don't want anybody looking deep into everything that you're doing. And that's what happens when you bring attention to yourself. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, Bill. You, you don't, the next thing you know, you're on a headline with some negative, you know, press. And nobody wants that. And it can yeah. be over nothing. Right. We've seen that happen. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I first started off, 
I mentioned one guy, Art Reynolds. There was another guy, Billy Fitzgerald, who had, uh, was a head of the, he was the founder and head of the largest black bank in the country, Independence Federal Bank. And so I was about 27, 28 years old. And uh, he told, well, told me that I, you need to, you know, stay low key. Yep. You want to be quiet. And he gave me the example, a rat peeing on cotton. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so and so I adopted that for a while, but I yeah. realized the more I grew, I got attention anyway because my my opposition and the business establishment what didn't want what I represented. What I represented was that black business people can do this too. And so when I started in DC, the media started, you know, attacking me. So the first time I did my first deal at 26 years old, uh, the Washington Post reporter called me up, and I thought he was calling to, you know, congratulate me and do a special interest story about, you know, a born and raised D.C. person, black man building a new building in a black community. And instead, he wanted to talk about my relationship with the mayor and take a shot at me there. So I got on the front page of the Washington Post at 26 years old um, next to Ronald Reagan <laughs> and my little building in southeast D.C. But I walked into a restaurant where a lot of the uh, – black business people were and they came over these older men came over to me and said welcome to the club so I realized that no matter what I wasn't going to be able to do it quietly and after a couple more things like that so I decided you know what if the rule the rules I'm gonna play by different rules mm -hmm. and so I felt that letting people know that what we were doing and that I'm out here could serve as an inspiration for other young black men and women to say, hey, I can do that too. Absolutely. And hey, it's not going to be easy, but he's doing it. So, so right. can I. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Po politically, do you know, do these politicians come to y'all, of course, to make donations and stuff? And, and if so, does that give y'all some type of power when it comes to them? Are y'all able, yeah, yeah. able to demand things from yeah. them and push for certain <laughs> legislation? I'm going to let Don answer that one. <laughs> so, I grew up, I mean, I grew up in D.C. In my last two years of high school, I worked on, I was a page on the Hill and I went to school at the Library of Congress from 6 a.m. to 10.30 and walked across the street to the Capitol to work. So I did that for two years in high school um, and learned a lot about politics. I've been involved in politics my entire career. I was on Obama's uh, National Finance Committee for both of his elections, Bill Clinton's as well. Wow. What I learned over the years is that you can have some access to some people, but even there, we get discriminated against. I mean, so we're big supporters of many different politicians, but they will be willing to jump over backwards to help a white business person who is, you know, at a high level. And but when it comes to us, they'll decide when they're going to treat us fairly and mm -hmm. when they're not mm -hmm. and that the money's not as impactful. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a subtlety. And I don't know if I'm explaining it right. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying That's is that our money yeah. isn't as good as the other people's money when it comes to many politicians. Even if you have the same amount of money, even oh, yeah. if, you're, even if yeah. financially y'all on equal footing. Yep. You'll tell us so, there's right. a wall between policy and making decisions as a government leader wow. and uh, your money. And uh, I, and yeah. so what I've done, and, that, and so that, so fundraising and contributing money is kind of the carrot. So I said, okay, the carrot doesn't work, I'll use a stick. So a couple <laughs> times that these people have crossed me and treated me unfairly, I form a political action committee and I run an independent campaign against them. Ooh. And because mm -hmm. I figure if I got some money, I need to use it at least to level the playing field for, for what I'm trying to do. That's right. And so I'm not going to take it on the chin. And, and that's the other thing is that they think that they can, you know, screw us over and get away with it. So I try to send a message, you know, there's some re there, there are going to be some repercussions if you treat us unfairly. You think we do ourselves a disservice by always voting Democrat, always being with one party, being so loyal to one party? Yes, I think so. I think we need to vote our party. What's, what policies are important to us. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if a politician, as Don said earlier, uh, runs pension funds and does, not, and does not make sure black people are part of that, why vote for that politician? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just stop yeah, and I, look for the one who does. And that one who does might be a Republican, mm -hmm. might be an independent. But does it matter? You need to vote your policies. Right. And What's all, important to you? And get them to agree to some s concrete things. So I chaired the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Board, which is the 
think tank for the 50 some odd black members of Congress and does that legislative weekend in Washington, Mm D.C. So I chaired that last three years of Obama's um, administration and then going into Trump's first year. And I told the caucus members when Trump came in, I know him and he's transactional. Go there, go meet with him with a list of things for black people because you all weren't elected to be Democrats. You were elected to advocate for black people, your constituents. Mm. So go with a list of what your constituents want and tell them you want this and ask him what does he want and see if there's a deal to be made. But you can't put the black agenda on hold for eight, four to eight years because right. you don't like the guy in the office. You got to play a <laughs> game right. of power. You got to constantly fight because our agenda can't wait. We got to push our agenda every moment. So we should do business with whoever we have to to get our program going forward. And so if it's a Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green Party, whoever it is, we be, need to tell them what we want. And if they're willing to give it to us on terms that are reasonable to us, we got to do business with them. And then we can vote again later. But we can't. The Democratic Party takes us for granted. That's right. Mm-hmm. And they have for a very long time. And they can and they use and they excite us and they get us agitated by calling people racist. At the end of the day, when I was in high school, the majority leader of the United States Senate was a guy named Robert Byrd. So he came to our every week we had a class. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had a, a, a page school every week. A, a political leader would come and speak to our class for an hour. So you read up on them and so forth. So I read up and found out that Robert Byrd was a former Ku Klux Klan member. Mm-hmm. And so I'm asking around, how could that be? Is this really true? So you can imagine me as a 17-year-old boy saying, wait a minute, the, the majority leader of the United States Senate, a Democrat, was a Ku Klux Klan member. So he evolved and changed and was acceptable to the Democratic Party. But how he saw us certainly is different than how we see ourselves. Mm-hmm. So we did business with him. So at the end of the day, we got to have an agenda, a permanent agenda advancing us forward. And frankly, we should be on the front steps of the White House telling Joe Biden, this isn't enough. It's great that you appointed a qualified woman to the Supreme Court, a black woman, and and she's qualified as anybody they've ever nominated. Great. She's going to serve the country well. All right. But here's what we need. Yeah, and he owes the majority, 6'3", right, right, right. in the Supreme Court. Yeah, right. Expand the Supreme Court and add four Jacksons yeah. if you want to. If you want to really right. make an impact. Yeah. But also, he's responsible for the 1994 crime bill. That's right. And I tell him to his face. He's responsible for it. He's cleaned it up. And he, I mean, I mean, he has not addressed that yet. Hmm. And he spoke passionately. And he was the floor leader in the Senate for Bill Clinton um, for the 1994 crime bill. Um, that led to the mass incarceration of black men and women mm-hmm. and, and these mandatory sentences that destroyed lives. So he's got to clean that up. And he's got to clean that up, not just with criminal justice reform, because that's only going to deal with what's going forward. And that has to be done, by the way. And it, and it really hadn't been done yet. But secondly, he's got to make right what he's done to our community and our people since 1994, because that bill wrecked well, havoc. Before the 90s. Yeah. Because, you know, the mandatory minimum sentencing and the crack laws, that was the 80s. 80s, you're right. Yeah. yeah. And was, I remember when I, when I said that to him, I said, um, you know, it led to mass incarceration. He said, no, it didn't. It was the mandatory minimum in the 80s. I said, well, you wrote that too. Right. <laughs> 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 that Who was easy to do business with? <laughs> Is it Biden or was it Trump to do business with? I think Trump would, would be easier to do business with because there's no competing interest and he's a decisive person. I think that the Democratic um, president's have tried to make this mass, this this rainbow constituency happy. So same thing about reparations and and, and minority contracting. Mm -hmm. I look at those, I look at minority contracting and affirmative action very differently. So this country owes two classes of people a great debt. It owes Native Americans a great debt because the founding fathers came over here, stole their land and slaughtered them and destroyed their communities, right? And then... It owes black people a debt because black people, our ancestors, were kidnapped and brought over here and worked for free for 250 years Mm -hmm. and built the country for free, free labor. So that the country owes black people a tangible debt, 250 years of free labor, another 100 plus years of Jim Crow and absurdly unfair conditions and oppressive conditions. So, but if somebody else immigrates here, um, 
we, this country gave them an opportunity. They actually owe the country a debt. Um, and, and so that is very different. And white women, when they decided they wanted to vote, they got the right to vote. When they decided they wanted to work, they had to fight a little bit, but not long. They didn't have to have a whole civil rights movement to get it. Mm-hmm. They got it real quickly. Mm-hmm. So this country owes black people debt. And, if we could, and, and by diluting um, MWBE contracting, making it MWBE instead of black contracting, um, it, it, it dilutes the impact. And that's part of the problem. And then, you know, I think that most Americans may not admit it, admit it publicly, but in their own homes, most white Americans will acknowledge that the country owes our people a debt. But it'll stop there. They don't feel like they owe other people, you know, Asian Americans who came here, which is great, and they make, they make big contributions to our country. But the country doesn't owe them a debt. Mm-hmm. It owes black people a debt. Absolutely. And it's time to pay that. And Biden could do that. Um, frankly, I was disappointed because I thought that um, President Obama should have done it. Um, and, um, you know, but, 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 you know, we would have Trump is transactional. Mm-hmm. So you can do business with him today and be against him tomorrow. He's going ex- to he's going to understand that because he's wired that way. So we have to be focused on getting business done. And to this point in time. I can't think about what the president of the United States has done for black people. I agree. And he's been in office for a year. So how long do we have to wait for the man that we single-handedly put into office? Right. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And our agenda is always last, isn't it? Oh, yes. If at yes. all. Yep. Yes. Great conversation. Hey, Sister Cheryl, Brother Don. I feel like I went to church and class. <laughs> we did. We did. Ooh, Cheryl McKissack, Daniel, Don Peoples. I mean, that was class. That Man. Was class. That was a course. So what's the call to action? What Greg Cardone would have charged us 5000 for that one, but go ahead. We need everyone to talk about Affirmation Tower. Okay. We need this to be a movement because this is going to change how we position ourselves. It's changing a paradigm for black people, not only in New York, but in our nation. And that's the call to action. Everyone needs to be talking about Affirmation Tower. They need to be writing the state if they can. I don't care if they're not even in the state. Mm-hmm. They can write the state mm-hmm. and say, listen, this is something we need to see. Mm-hmm. This is important to our agenda as black people. Mm-hmm. They need to call the governor's office of New York mm-hmm. and say that they That's support it. They need to call their, uh, if they are New York City resident or New York State resident. They need to call their elected officials and say that they support this project and they support what it stands for, which is economic opportunity for black businesses. Mm-hmm. And, and, and going forward, we got to hold anybody running for office that wants our support. What are you going to do for us economically? That's right. What are you going, how are you going to write this scales of injustice that we are dealing with? And that's the call to action. Economic empowerment for our people will lead us to a much better place. Because we can, what did James Brown say? I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open the door, I'll get it myself. That's right. Right? Well, that's what we want. Open the doors of opportunity. Let us do our thing. We right. have shown. I want both, Don. I want to open the door and I want something to be sitting on the table when I walk in. I agree with you. And it should be. By the way, our our ancestors paid for it. By the way, and everybody else gets to grow with generational wealth, passing down property and businesses to their kids. Our ancestors built this country and we got nothing for it. Right. They got nothing for it but extreme oppression. And so this country owes us a debt. The White House that Biden is sleeping in was built by slaves. That's right. That's it. Well, we appreciate you guys Ooh. for joining us. Thank you so much. Man. And please, anytime y'all want to pull up, pull, pull up. up. All right. Okay. Yeah. We will. Absolutely. Okay. We will. Absolutely. Right. It's the Thank Breakfast you. Club. Good morning. Thank you. 